this podcast has adult content, adult words, and something about Czech cereal. That is your listener warning. Today's guest on the podcast is Amy Dresner. She's the author of the new book, My Fair Junkie, a memoir of getting dirty and staying clean. We talk about some very important topics, addiction, recovery, suicide, and more. I think it's an important conversation and that we keep it going. I would use some discretion with young children in the car, but I wouldn't necessarily use discretion with maybe your teenagers or slightly older ones. I'll let you be the judge. You're the parent. But we do need to keep talking about these topics. And Amy's new book is just what this world needs. So I hope you all enjoy this episode with Amy Dressner. Welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast with Meredith Atwood. We all have the same 24 hours each day, and it's what we do with those hours that makes all the difference between our health, happiness, and success. I'm good. How are you? I am still getting over that flu, but I'm okay. Oh. Oh my gosh. I didn't have the flu last week, but I had some, I guess it was two weeks ago. And I, I mean, my voice suffered until like two days ago. Oh yeah. I'm still congested and like really tired, but I was just like, I got to just move forward. Yeah. It was brutal. Oh. It was so brutal. Man. So you had like the bona fide flu. Oh yeah. Like I was sweating at night and shaking and like, like leg cramps and like I had to go, I went to urgent care. They put me on Tamiflu, which I guess makes some people like totally hallucinate or something. (laughs) (laughs) Some people are like, like, uh, they're like, I was like really irritable and I I borderline suicidal. I'm like, I'm not, that's my natural state. So (laughs) that didn't bother me. But yeah. People are like, I hallucinated. I was like, oh, it hasn't been that much fun for me. The only thing flying around my room has been phlegm and my cat, Colonel Puff Puff. But Colonel Puff it, Puff. <laughs> but it really, it really helped. It really helped. But yeah, people went berserk. They're like, it was banned in Japan for 10 years. I'm like, oh, okay, calm down. Oh, that's funny. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I had, I had the flu like 20 years ago, and I had hallucinations. I don't think I was on Tamiflu or anything, but it's from I, fever. Yeah, I had a fever. It was so high that I was hallucinating, Oof. and I was like moving nuclear weapons. <laughs> and I mean, it was the weirdest thing, but it was really freaking serious. You know, I was moving <laughs> so these nuclear funny. weapons. Oh, that's the funniest thing I remember. <laughs> I love that you you're doing something so heavy duty. And it important. was so important. I mean, you know? is that like oh, like a snail on the wall, or like <laughs> you're like I was moving nuclear weapons, and I had like you know a level five pass. <laughs> like, I mean, it was bizarre, but I was like digging like places with my hands to put them i mean i remember it clear as day because i was so scared yeah that's scary and then i realized i think it was because that was like the year that movie the rock came out with nicholas cage and he had this like little green explosives that he had to like carry 70 days on meth and didn't hallucinate like hallucination (laughs) doesn't seem to be like my like in my brain's repertoire despite like a heavy history of schizophrenia (laughs) which is like incredible to me well, I feel like we should just, I mean, I've been recording, so, hey, guys, this is Amy Dressner. <laughs> this is just too good. I mean, why well, intro you, you know, but so funny. Um, yeah, nuclear weapons. We've covered meth and the flu. I mean, we're off to a raging start. Right. Already. Um, yeah. We're well, I'm glad you're sort of back from the dead. Um, I'll try and keep you awake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm All right. So talk. let's talk about this amazing book, man. Oh. I was, you had me from the dedication, which was oh. for anybody who thinks it's too late. So you were a junkie. I was. I was a really, really bad drug addict for on and off for 20 years and an alcoholic. And um, I just. I would get years of sobriety and I would relapse. Years. And six, yeah, years. So it's like, you know, my parents were like, woo, she's got it. And then I would just eat it again. And it was like, it was terrible. I've been in six treatment centers and like four psych wards, tried to kill myself a bunch of times. And I really at one point was just kind of like, I, this is, I'm going to die this way. And, um, what started I, it? What was, what was your first drug of choice and how, how did it start? 
So, you know, my story is ironic because I'm very, I was like a late bloomer. So I'm not someone who was like smoking weed at 11. That wasn't my story. I was like a really a good girl. I was like straight A student. Like I didn't kiss anyone until I was 18. I didn't, you know, like I didn't smoke. My father was like, you know, I bet you'll smoke or drink or do drugs before you're 18 years old. And if not, I'll give you a thousand dollars. And I always joke, that's how Jews raise each other. We just bribe each other. So (laughs) (laughs) I waited till I was 19 because I was at this point, I was like obsessed with my own purity and I was like kind of afraid of drugs and alcohol and which I should have been because my mom is recovering alcoholic. I have a lot of addiction and mental illness in my family. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so I drank at 19 in college, but it looked like everyone, I mean, yeah, I threw up and I blacked out, but it was college in the nineties, eighties. It looked like everyone else was drinking. It didn't look that crazy. You know what I mean? And it was at 24 when I found crystal meth that uh, something clicked for me. And it was like, this is what, what I need to be on the planet. Like, I feel normal. For the first time in my life, I feel normal. And where and I, were you? Like, where did you? I was in San Francisco. I was 24 years old. And I had been on a lot of antidepressants. And I thought, this is the antidepressant I need. This is This is... Why, why are they messing around with Prozac? Like, this is what I need. <laughs> Everyone needs and, that. Yeah, and I just, it made me feel normal. I felt wow. confident. I had energy. I wasn't depressed. Like, I felt like, oh, I can be on the planet. I didn't wake up with, like, this huge, like, weight on my chest every morning. Just like, ugh. And um, it, I didn't know that my mom had been addicted to amphetamines at that point. I didn't know my uncle had been addicted to amphetamines. So, obviously, it was, like, completely, I was, like, genetically predisposed and um, it just clicked for me, and I was off. And I had never been around drug addicts, so I didn't really recognize the signs of my own addiction. I was like, I'm just, I'm just experimenting every day, all day. You know what I mean? like I, <laughs> I'm so I, wild I and fun. See it as a problem. I'm like, I'm just having a phase. This is fun, right. and I'm in San Francisco, and like being free, you know. And it was like. And then it got it got really out of control. Even other drug addicts were like, "Whoa, girl, slow down!" Like, "Oh my you were god!" Like winning, you were the winner of all drug addicts, right? Yeah, you're it gonna was, do it, do it well. Yeah, I was like full on in the very beginning, and um, so I ended up getting like a huge infection in my face from snorting like street speed, and that's when I had to kind of kind of clean to my parents and just go, "Hey, like, I have a." problem and they were just devastated because so what is an infection in the face that in my nose I was snorting so much my whole I got this weird infection in my nose and my whole face like like blew up wow yeah and I mean my parents you know if your kid's not a drug addict by 24 you're pretty much like you know hey you know dodge that bullet um and they just, I never, that wasn't my bag. You know what I mean? I was like a good girl. So right. they were, sh- they were really shocked and really upset and horrified. And, um, they moved me back to LA thinking I wouldn't be a drug addict in LA. Cause I was <laughs> like, you know, San Francisco is the problem. And of course, you know, it continued. And then I ended up having a seizure in a market, uh, about a year and a half later, and I woke up in an ambulance and I agreed to go to treatment for the first time. And how old were you then? Like 26? 25. Oh, yeah. Well, this was a year. So you just like it went was, at it. Oh, well, it was, I mean, I stayed for 17 days once, 17 days on crystal. I was like writing a new Bible and based on Emerson and Nietzsche. <laughs> I thought I had the mathematical equation for God. It was right? really out. See, yeah. this is why I never did drugs because I'm an addict too. I'm just a, an alcoholic. And so I never did. I always have this joke. I never did cocaine because I knew I would have loved it. It would have made me skinny and super productive. So I never tried it because I knew I would have been addicted. Well, my dad <laughs> said the same 17 thing. days. I'm like, oh my God, the things you could That's accomplish crystal. in 17 I mean, days. I ended, up, I ended up doing coke. I ended up shooting cocaine later oh, wow. because I didn't want to touch crystal meth at that point because it had given me epilepsy. It gave me a seizure disorder, which I still have to this day. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, well, I relapsed, but I didn't want to touch crystal because I was like, that stuff's made with like gun bluing and Drano. It's not natural. Let's do cocaine because that's made from at least leaves. And I ended up cheap, which is just such addict thinking like this. This is different. This is better. This is healthier. It'll be okay. 
and uh, I started shooting cocaine with a seizure disorder, which I do not recommend. So See, you I'm know, they're so there's... naive when it comes to actual like street drugs. Okay, so meth is like manufactured. Meth is like made out of like pseudoephedrine right. and like all kinds of gross shit. That's it's the a complete... damn reason you can't get like good drugs at CVS anymore <laughs> without your driver's That's license. That's why you have to show your license. Yeah. 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 Okay. Why you like? A cold, they're like, Can you see your license? Um, yeah. yeah. So, meth is completely chemical and synthetic, and cocaine, at least, I mean, it's cut with all kinds of gross stuff, but it's like, at least, it's like, its base is natural. And so, why would you shoot it versus snort it? Like, what's the difference? Um, so, I'd relapsed out of my second rehab, and um, I just thought uh, I, this guy came over to get high with me, and he was he was like a bona fide junkie. He had been like a junkie for years. Like a and he was shooting speed balls, which is heroin and cocaine. And he'd been in a bunch of rehabs. And he was just like, Why are you snorting it? Like it's so much better high if you shoot it and you use less drugs. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, I mean, at that point I was like, Well, I just relapsed out of my second treatment center. I'm obviously gonna die a drug addict, so let's just like, you know, go full throttle and so i started shooting and plus the idea of like saving money as a jew i was like yay you know saving money (laughs) but plus also yeah yeah, plus money also you know you start to not you know your nose starts to turn on you eventually you know i mean when i checked into treatment my nose was bleeding right so i mean yeah i was like i used to have this joke when i was doing stand up that if i sneeze like you know, an eight ball and a few Colombians fall out of there. It's like, I mean, <laughs> so dumb. Did you tell so, that joke? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, now I have, like, a ton of scar tissue from all that stuff. Oh. And I can't breathe. I snore. My neighbors can hear me, like, through, like, three walls. Who wants to marry me? Okay. Everyone. Because you're so funny. But, like, how does this happen? I mean, I think that's what's so just intriguing. Because, I mean, similar background, but different. I mean... I, you know, I was a good girl too. And then I just became a drunk and it was kind of the same thing. Like it was just a phase and I was in college and, and then I just, what, I just did this thing all the time, every day, all day, you know, not all day, but you know, damn. I mean, I don't know what your background is. I mean, I think, God, I think we're still learning so much about it. I mean, you know, you've got Gabor Mate who believes it's all trauma based. Hmm. But then, you know, I'm more of the wet. I think that for some people it's trauma-based. Um, I think that also trauma can change your brain chemistry. So I think it's more complicated than just, like, you know, having a crappy childhood and, like, having a hole inside your heart. You know what I mean? Like, not feeling good enough or whatever. Um, I mean, I've been really getting into my friend Dr. Wetzman's work, which is all about the biology of yeah. addiction. And I've been posting his videos because I think he's a genius. And um, he talks about genetic mutations that addicts have. He used to do a, he used to have a, a treatment center. He's doing genetic testing, and he explains all of the things that can go that that are biologically wrong with an addict, which makes them predisposed. There, you're, you're an addict before you pick up, right? So, from and you're some, doing some I other think, bullshit addict behavior before then too. Yeah, I mean, I was, I I was, I had a full blown eating disorder before I ever picked up alcohol. I was completely anorexic and bulimic. Yeah. And then I found alcohol and then I found crystal and I was like, this, hey, you know, this is the way. Mm -hmm. Um, Screw, you know, an hour on the, on the Stairmaster. This is (laughs) a rail of this and I'm good. (laughs) Um, But um, I was obviously, you know, uncomfortable in my skin, insecure, depressed, all that kind of stuff coming into it. But again, Wetzman explains a lot of that is because our brain chemistry is off before we, when we, before we even pick up. Like I was definitely depressive and all that kind of stuff. And so I was attracted to the uppers that would sort of make me less depressed, would give me energy, all that kind of stuff. I mean, his stuff's really interesting. I think we're just, I think it's so much more complicated. And then I think there are people that like literally develop addiction that like go off to war and come back and have like such gnarly PTSD, you know, that they have to just like drink or do drugs to just deal yeah. because of the horrors that they've seen. 
So I don't, I, and I think they're, so I think it's different for everybody. And I think they're all really interconnected. I mean, our thoughts affect our brain chemistry. It's all really complicated, you know? Yeah. So your um, book, um, my fair junkie, a memoir of getting dirty and staying clean. It was so funny and sad and funny. <laughs> I mean, I like on right at the beginning, I underlined this. Linda, you were talking about your friend, Linda. Oh, Linda. Linda and I are both depressive Scorpios obsessed <laughs> with true crime shows and threadbare vintage tees. I was like, oh, I would have been friends with Amy. Because <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> I mean, just the way you, you phrase things are so funny. You know, you have the credit score of a crack whore. <laughs> it's better now. It's better now. Six years in. Thank God. I yeah. Mean, just such a great book. But um, and I don't, when I talk to authors, I don't usually underline quite as much and like bring it up. But mm-hmm. I, you know, addiction and talking about it is totally my jam. And I, I just I want to bring this part out. You You were talking about. I think you, this was one more time where you were put in rehab and you say, this is classic addiction. You think you've got the monster in the box. You're hopeful, relieved, maybe even arrogant that you have a handle on it. And then bam, you eat dirt. Alcoholism is a sneaky bitch. She waits for the one moment when you trust her and let your guard down. You have to be ever vigilant against her. And I am anything but true right just i mean it's and and that's what's so scary about addiction like for me i'm three and a half years sober congratulations and I'm like, well th- thanks until i eat dirt right <laughs> <laughs> You're like yeah you know what you want to have like, three and a half years sober no i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah, right no, you're totally not, gonna no, not everyone's story is a story of chronic relapse but i also you know that was my story which made it very difficult to create a god and this is what editors want they want narrative arc and it's like how do you create a narrative arc out of 20 years of relapse you know what i mean that's like that's not because addiction is is innately repetitive and redundant and groundhog's day yes. you know what i mean it'll oh be different gosh, this time yes. it's not it'll be different this time it's not i got it oh i don't have it you know what i mean and so it was really difficult to create that narrative arc that my publisher that my editor wanted um, you did a beautiful job with it. And, and that's so true what you're saying about, you know, I got it. I don't, I think I just went through that sort of cycle without knowing I was doing the cycle. You know what I mean? Cause I would be like, I'm, I'd wake up, I'd pour out all the booze in the house. Today was the uh, day. Right. And then at one o'clock I'd start sweating and then it would repeat. It's, it's almost like I did that song and dance for 10 years yeah, until I yeah. finally quit. Like it was like every day was a relapse. <laughs> Right. No, yeah. I mean, get, like, a lot of days. people get, I mean, a lot of people, you know, decide to get sober and really just, they, it sticks, you know, and I think that, um, but I was trying to talk to the people who, you know, had kept relapsing and really had felt shame coming back into the rooms or felt like they didn't believe in themselves anymore or felt like they were just too old. It was too late to get it. And I was just like, no, it's not. You know what I mean? It's not. And that's the thing I wanted to say is like, for most of us, relapse is part of it. And you're never too, it's never too late. If you're alive, it's not too late. And that was really the message I wanted to get across. And I mean, that relapse where I tried to stab my ex and then like ended up losing. Okay, so tell that story. This will sell you a lot of books. I I was sober for a couple of years and I was in this horrific marriage, really unhappy, married someone, thought they would fix me, classic like woman crap, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. classic addict stuff, CODA stuff, you know, this person will fix me and because I didn't want to fix myself and I didn't think I could Um, and that marriage got really gnarly really quickly and... I relapsed on Oxycontin. They gave it to me for a shoulder injury. And of course, forget it. It's like it's on. Now, um, was your husband, like, was he a, a user or a drinker at all? Can't talk any about any of that because okay. of legal reasons. So okay. we'll stay away from him. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to sue. So we'll just leave him <laughs> out of it. <laughs> Damn lawyers. Oh, you had a great quote about lawyers, too. I got to find that one. Okay. Oh, 
they're like prostitutes. They pretend they love you and then they fuck you or something. They take your money and fuck you or something. Right. <laughs> I underlined that one too. I was like, oh. Uh, I did get, actually have a good experience with a lawyer with my entertainment lawyer because my book has been optioned for TV development and my entertainment oh. lawyer has been amazing, which has given me new faith in lawyers. Well, good. There's always yeah, some good my, ones. I'm a recovering my, lawyer, so. A recovering lawyer, but my criminal lawyer and my divorce attorney were both horrific and did nothing. Um, so I had relapsed and we got in a fight on Christmas of 2011 and it got physical and I don't know. I just, I mean, one of the reasons I don't use and drink is because it, it really changes my personality. It makes me into someone else. It's, that's really scary. And um, I snapped and I went and I pulled a knife and I threatened him. I brandished the knife and I was like, I'll gut you like a fish, you fat fuck. And he <laughs> called the cops on me and I got arrested for felony domestic violence with a deadly weapon and I went to jail. Wow. And, and he, yeah, that was the end of that marriage because no one really likes to, to be good. Likes to, like yeah, they're like, well, oh, yeah, likes to be married to you if you're trying to kill them. But, um, uh, I lost everything and I ended up penniless in a psych ward on medical disability. And that was sort of the beginning of this sobriety where I did a year of domestic violence counseling and 240 hours of community labor, me yes. and 40 Mexican guys sweeping shit and syringes and condoms on Hollywood Boulevard. 240 and was, hours. That's a long oh, time. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I swear to God. I mean, that was really that made it, that shifted me in such a that was like a spiritual epiphany. I mean, I remember first showing up, you know, and I'm a Beverly Hills Jew, so it's like I'm like I was all, you know, I had come from a trust fund. I'd lost everything. I'd burned through everything with my addiction. And so like I show up, I'm like these people are criminals. I'm oh like god, like what am I doing here? I'm like gross, you know? And literally I had more time than anyone else. I was the only one there for violent assault. <laughs> like <laughs> It was so humbling. You were the like, worst on the yeah, the guys they were like, "What you here for, Weta? You know, I mean, for a DUI. What you here for?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm here for felony domestic violence with a deadly weapon." They were like, "Oh shit!" You know, it was like <laughs> nobody screwed with me, and it was really so. It was like 240 hours of sweeping the streets, and yeah, nobody would talk to us except for homeless people who were like, "Stay out of the pen." Like, I know it sucks, you know. But everyone else was like, you guys are criminals, except for like a couple people who thought we were doing environmental work. And they were like, oh, my God, I love the environmentalism you're doing. How do I become part of this and beautify the city? I'm like, oh, it's so easy, honey. Felony <laughs> domestic. Clothes. Yeah. So and I just remember sweeping. So I'm in sober living. I'm in my what? Second, third sober living in like a year. And um. I'm 42 years old. I have no money. I'm on medical disability. I'm sweeping trash. And I I was like, poor me, like blah, blah, blah. And then I had this epiphany and I thought, hold on. This could be the best thing that ever happened to you. Or it could be the worst thing that ever happened to you. And you get to decide what that is. Like what if this was orchestrated – specifically for you to have this transformation that's going to change your life. Like, are there lessons here? You think this is an accident? And then later I came across that Will Rogers quote, which is like, the worst thing that happens to you can be the best thing for you if you don't let it get the best of you. And I just thought, okay, like, if I don't finish this, I'm going to go to jail. And if I don't change my attitude about this, I'm just... I'm going to be miserable the entire time I do this. So where's the joy? Where's the fun? Where are the lessons? And I just embraced it. And it was a completely different experience for me than it was for other people. And it changed me. It it, it fundamentally changed me. So what were the rules? I, I love how you very quickly established yourself as like the expert. Of the chain gang. <laughs> well, because I had more time than anyone else. So people right. would like, it was like rotating. So you'd see someone and then you wouldn't see them again. And everyone was like, you know everything. It's like, yeah, because I've been here for months, you know. Um, oh, you couldn't be on your phone at any time except break time. You couldn't smoke a cigarette while we're working. You, you had to wear your, um, you couldn't talk to strangers. You couldn't talk to each other while sweeping. You had to wear your seatbelt in the in the car at all times. 
uh, yeah, you couldn't slack yeah. off. Like, I think that's pretty much it. Some, some crew bosses were much cooler, you know, and were like, would let us laugh and talk and other stuff. And then there was that one woman who absolutely hated me. <laughs> and so eventually as I, as I, the more I showed up, the more I would be like, please, you know, let me be on, you know, Esteban's crew. And they would like, you know, they, they liked me and I was funny and, you know, but I used to have to mop and sweep the entire, the office and stuff like that. And, uh, it was interesting. It was, uh, yeah, manual labor is a whole other world, you know? I think that's like an important component of recovery though, is either, oh. you know, wor- working, moving your body in a way that hurts. <laughs> I agree with you. Well, that's now why, you know, I think exercise is a really big thing for me. And I also have written an article about that. And it's like, I think that recovery can get really heady. We get really in our heads and you know, when we're in our addiction, our body is basically like a vessel to get loaded. Like how can, you know what I mean? That's all it is. We don't care about it. We don't take good care of it. Right. You know, and I think that, and I do a lot of breath work and stuff like that. And I think that, you know, and I think meditation, all that stuff, it's like, you know, um, recovery can be really heady in terms of like thinking and doing the steps and analyzing your behavior. And it's like, sometimes you just need to just like access your body, you know, and move stuff through your body. Yeah. And change your feelings through your body. And that was the other thing, too, that I really learned in this sobriety, which was like, screw your feelings. What are your actions? Like, you know, I had a sponsor and he said, you don't have to be a good person. You just have to act like one. No one knows the difference. And I started to <laughs> act like the person. You know, and it's true, though. Yeah. No shit about your intentions. No, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I meant to be there. It's like, did you come or did you not come? Like, you know, I don't no one cares about your 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 intentions. Like I had great intentions and I was just, I was like destroying people, my and everyone else's lives. Right. Wow. That's really powerful. Yeah. And it's like, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. It was like, I was just trying, you know, I mean, so, so I just started to act like the person I wanted to be. And basically you change your neural pathways through contrary repetitive action over and over and over again. It's called bidirectionality. Aren't I smart? Um, (laughs) You sound like a writer. (laughs) <laughs> and um, you you can actually change your default, and then that's you. So now yeah. the me is the person that shows up on time and keeps her word and, you know, all that kind of stuff, thinks about other people, which that wasn't who I was a couple years ago. Yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, and it's going to take me another five years because every <laughs> sentence – is just so important. Like I have heard of that book. Oh my gosh. Well, I think it's, I'm on rule like four, but I think the one rule three and someone will be like, that is not the rule. And I don't have it in front of me, but it's something like treating yourself the way that you would treat other people. I mean, a very simple rule, but it, there's like, he just dials it down to like, don't be around shitty people. Yeah. Like you don't have to be friends with shitty people. And then he kind of flips it. Like also don't be a shitty person, you know? And it it all does come down to action. It's so true. Like fake it till you fake the earnest. Yeah. And I was so against that. I was like all about my truth. I was like, well, that's not true. And I'm about being authentic. And it was like, that just wasn't serving me at all. Yeah. You know? And so I just, you know, it's like I realized, like, you know, fuck your feelings. Like, you do what you need to do. Like, because if you wait till you're ready, you wait forever. Right. Whether it's to work out or write a book or whatever it is. You know what I mean? It's like you take the action and that makes you ready. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's ding, ding, ding. Yeah. It took me so long to figure that out, though. It took me years of relapsing, you know, to realize, like, hey, I can want to get high and still not get high. How's that? Yeah, it's magic. You know? Yeah, it's like you can have an urge and, you know, and go, wow, I really feel like using and still not use. And guess what? The urge passes whether you use or not. You give it 20 mm-hmm. minutes. Well, so, yeah, you know, I, I I did like the first three years sober pretty easily. Like, not easy, but it was easy for me to just walk away from it. But like recently, I've really begun – noticing alcohol more and I realized that the biggest way I recovered was 
pretending like it didn't exist, um, not making eye contact with it. And, oh, and wow. I think that just like kept the urge away. Like I realized that I could sit at dinner with eight people sharing four bottles of wine and not even notice that they have, that they were drinking. Like you I just was blocked able, it out. You just totally yes, blocked it out. I was able to blind it. Like that's was my biggest like tip. And then I realized I could be at a bar and I would hear a martini shaker go, and I can't do anything about my ears. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be like, mm? you know, like really? That. I, no, I've been in relationships with people who didn't seem to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I'm funny. in two doubt. Yeah. But it's funny because lately I have been making eye contact with alcohol more. Mm. I've noticed it. Mm. And for that awareness of it kind of existing in my world again. Like, for example, I walked into this dining room to do this podcast and we have a bar. I just never look at it because it's not for me. You know, that's, right, that's right. my husband or people that come over. But the, today I looked at it and I don't know if it was because I was about to talk to you. I was like, do I need to remember what that is over there? Um, but it's weird because when you say, you know, addicts go and have years and then relapse, like, this has been very helpful for me because it, it's caused me to be aware because I think that's how you relapse, right? You somehow lose the awareness. Well, I think that a, it's different for a lot of people. I think some people, some of my relapses have been, I never really drifted away from the program or anything like that. Most of my relapses were me being in so much pain over a life event, like mm -hmm. a breakup or something like that, that I just thought, fuck it. I don't care. Like I got, I need to anesthetize and not, I, I, you know, rarely did I think it was going to be different. I had done that experiment so many times, like maybe early on where I was like, I can smoke pot cause I hate pot and it'll be fine. <laughs> and it was totally not fine. Right. Um, I was smoking pot every day and hating it. And then I started drinking again and then I started doing Coke. And then, I mean, so, um, but for a lot of people, I think, I mean, it depends. I think, I've also built a life where I I am happy enough in it to not have to check out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you want to build a life where you don't need to anesthetize. You're not in so much pain. You don't hate it so much that or yourself that you have to check out. That's so um, important. You have to build a life. Yeah, that yeah. you just that you want to stay sober for. You know that you don't want to burn to the ground. And that takes time. And it's like, um, I think also for a lot of us, it's like also going, like really playing it through, going, okay, I, f I don't think it's a, it's a sign that something's wrong with you or you're working a bad program or your recovery sucks because you feel like drinking. I, I, I think as an alcoholic and an addict, that's our natural state is to go there. And it was you know, your solution for a really long time. So obviously that's going to be your first thought, you know? Right. So I think to, uh, to think like, oh, well, that's a bad sign in your recovery. Like, bullshit. I don't buy that at all. I think, again, we can't control our thoughts, our feelings. We can only control our actions. And so I think the thing is like going, oh, okay, cool. I'm having this totally shitty thought. And like, that's interesting. And um, like, I'm not going to act on it. I'm going to call someone and tell them how I'm feeling and um also playing it through like where does it lead you like that was a big thing and i talk about jack grisham the lead singer of TS tsol wrote a book called an uh, uh, a principle of recovery and he talks about the difference for a lot of people who relapse there's like the emotional definition of getting loaded and then there's like the real definition of getting loaded and we get them confused. And like the emotional definition of us getting loaded is like, ah, oh, relief. You know what I mean? Like, I just need a break from life. And I just need to, you know, I want to unwind and ah, oh, take the edge off. But what's the real definition of getting loaded? Like what really happens to you? You know, you get arrested, you shit your pants, you get in a fight with people, you drunk dial, you fucking send horrible, like whatever right. happens, you lock yourself out of your house, you get in a car accident, like what really happens? So it's like what you're seeking is relief. Right. So it's like, how can you give yourself relief without picking up? It's like, so now it's like, I'm like, okay, I'll, you know, take a bath. I'll go get a massage. I'll, you know what I mean? Like I'll have a cry. I'll take a nap. I'll like, it's like, I'm seeking relief. 
I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm seeking relief. That's what really it is. Right. You I mean, know. I used to be a smoker too. And, and oh, I noticed well, today. That's something I'm struggling with still. Yeah. On and off. Right. I mean, smoking would be my drug of choice, but now I'm like an athlete, quote unquote, and so it makes it kind of hard. I'm like, oh, that would suck to no, run. No, you can do it. I can, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't I work tell out you that, Amy. No, actually, my 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 problem with that has been that, um, um, and thank God for getting sick because that kicked it too. Uh, is thinking is that old thinking? I can just have one. Yeah. Going, oh, I can just have one. Because I have all these sponsees and all my sponsees smoke and vape and everyone at meetings smokes and vapes. And I'm thinking like, oh, I can just smoke one. And then, of course, I can't. Then I'm all of a sudden I bought a pack and then it's on. And, and I don't even really like smoking. But I like anything. It releases dopamine. I like dopamine. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, get, I noticed all the cigarette butts outside of Starbucks today. And they were all the same one. And I was like, oh. Look at this, all this yeah. marble. It's, it's going to be from smoking. It's going to be from something much more fun than that, you know? <laughs> but um, no, it's all dopamine, though. That's yeah. the whole yeah. thing. It's like seeking dopamine. Now you, you get dopamine from working out, you know? And I get a lot of, I get dopamine from helping people, you know? Like people going, God, your book, like, I can't tell you how much less alone I feel and I'm less ashamed. You made me laugh at things I was ashamed of. That gives me a surge of dopamine. Where right. before it was sex and drugs and booze and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So what was, what do you think about rock bottom? I mean, what was your rock bottom? Do you think you have to have one? I do not think you have to have one. I do not think you have to. I've seen too many people who have not hit rock bottom who have come into the rooms on a court card and had no intention of staying sober and got sober. Mm-hmm. So, um... And I know people with with much higher bottoms. So um, I think it depends on the person. I think some some of us, you know, are so uh, stubborn that we have to go to a place where we literally lose everything to get it and go, oh, this is so not going to work for me in any form. <laughs> um my rock bottom was absolutely losing everything and getting divorced and having a criminal thing and being in sober living for two and a half years and sweeping the streets. And uh, this sobriety has been completely different from any other sobriety because because of that. So while it was happening, I was like, why me? And now I look back and I'm like, thank God. Right. And I had no idea I'd write a book about it at the time. At one all. of the things your um, one of your counselors said that addicts were puddle people. Oh right, yeah. Because we have no it's emotional skeleton, nothing true, internal right? to hold us up. Yeah. Gosh, I was like, oh, I'm a puddle I person. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I feel like today. Puddles. Right, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was um, good. so let's talk about suicide and like attempts and 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 how. Let's go light. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's go. Let's, I want to. I want to be funny. So let's talk about <laughs> death and suicide. I had. I had an alcohol induced suicide attempt at twenty one that I don't remember much of. I just remember that I was taken to the hospital and I was talking to the psychologist who was determining whether I was fit to be released. Mm-hmm. And they were like, "We're going to let you go home." And I was like, good. And I was playing the system, right? I was right. like, I'm going to get to go home. I'm going to get released to my poor 24-year-old boyfriend oh, who's going to take me home with a knife, you know, wrist injury. Oh. And they, they were going to let me go. And so I was playing the system and I was saying all the right things. And then something in me snapped and I started cussing at the psychiatrist. And he was like, nope, you're going away. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Damn it. What did I do? And then my boyfriend comes in. He's like, what did you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I hate you too. And I just remember, <laughs> is it 5150? Or, yeah. You know, you, well, we were going to take you as a 5150 if you don't sign this paper. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm signing. I'll sign whatever. And then I'm, I rode in this van all the way to Atlanta from Athens. I was at University of Georgia at the time. And um, like, I, I remember, I look back on that and it was comical, but I mean, it was a bona fide suicide attempt, yeah. and, you know, and, and I, and then as I got older and 
I realize that I definitely veer toward those thoughts. And I guess that's where I wanted to go with it. Like, let's I still have those thoughts. That's still my out. That's still my out, you know, for everything. Like, well, if this doesn't work out, I'll just kill myself. And I'm like, oh, okay. It's still my trap door for everything. I mean, um, yeah, my first suicide attempt was, (sighs) let's see, which was the first risk, I guess was the overdose while I was married. Um, Intentional overdose? Yeah, I took all my phenobarbital for my epilepsy. Yeah, um, that was that's in the book. Um, that was the first one, and then uh, later I um, oh no, the first one was me slitting my wrists in England with mm-hmm. a box cutter. Yeah, oh, and getting nice. stitches. Yeah, and uh, yeah, in England they they. They're not, they don't 5150 you. They, she, she literally like sewed me up, gave me a tetanus shot. And she goes, you seem like a smart girl aside from this. She goes, aside from, the, aside from this little knife incident. And I go, it wasn't a knife. It was a box cutter. She goes, that's great, but you're not a box, saw you. And I was like, wow, no empathy. They got me, gave me a tetanus shot. They sewed up both my wrists and sent me on my way. And that was it. <laughs> not a box. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, my mom flew to London to bathe me because I had to, I had to keep the stitches dry for two weeks. So I had to bathe with saran wrap. Oh man. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I just remember the shame I had associated with the stupid, I got a tattoo over it now. And that was like the best thing I could have done. Oh, I, I still have got, scars. Yeah. I just got the tattoo like last year and I'm like, why didn't I get this tattoo a long time ago? Cause I mean, I had so much just shame around that. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I was so embarrassed of what had happened that I had my dad take out my stitches. And I was embarrassed of him doing oh. it. And then I passed out while he did it. Oh, shit. <laughs> I mean, just such a, such a giant badge I was, you know. And it's like I just – I still have so much shame around it, even though I still talk about really? it. Really? You know, wow. Yeah. I mean, I think it's – you know, it's which is I why think, I want to talk about it all the time to anyone who will listen. No, yeah. I don't have any shame around my suicide attempts. I was in so much pain. I had I wanted out. That's what it's about. Yeah, it's not that you really want to die. It's that you're in so much pain. You just want it to stop. And that's what I that's what I said earlier today. I was talking to someone. And I said it's not about actually wanting to end your life. It's about no. wanting to end the life you're in. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. To get a new really one. well put. You know, and yeah. it's just it's like um. The guy that wrote Infinite Jest, David Foster Wallace, and he talks about that. He talks about oh, it's like jumping. <laughs> it's like, I know, right? That's a huge, I know, right? And he killed himself. He ended up killing himself. Um, but he talks about that suicidal people are not, a, it's, like, it's like people who jump from a, a, a building that's in flames. They're not, it's not that they're not afraid of the fall. They're more afraid of the flames inside engulfing them. Right. And it's like, I don't have any shame about it. I mean, it really, it really upset and freaked out my friends and parents. They were really angry and upset. And then I did it again. Um, when I was drunk, I took a knife. That was like more like that didn't need stitches. That was more of like a, like a cry for help kind of thing. Like, look at it. I'm suffering. Um, because, I mean, you know, let's be honest. It's like I'm a smart girl. If I really wanted to take myself out, I could probably do it. You know, it's not like – so I think that it was more like – it's still something I, I, I suffer with is suicidal ideation. And um, I just – more so than even using because I know where using will take me. You know, I can't – I just can't rebuild my life again. It took me so long. Right. So gnarly. And so, um, but I have sponsees that have that stuff. And it's like, again, it's just a thought. You just bat it away and it's just a thought. And I think, you know, I think you should have empathy for yourself. I have empathy for that me who was so, who had no tools to deal with those feelings and was so in so much pain that they felt the need to do that. People go, oh, it's selfish. And it's easy to say if you've never been in that much pain. Right. And, and I think the hardest part is when you're, 
in that pain and you're like, I shouldn't be in this pain. I'm so blessed, 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 blessed. Yeah. Feeling and, guilty. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you're like, I've got nothing. What am I fucking depressed about? And I write about that in the book. Like, I'm like, like, you know, I felt guilty because I didn't think that I had anything to be that depressed and suicidal over, which made me feel even more like a piece of shit, you right. know? Right. And then, and then it just feeds the suicide of course. thoughts because you're like, well, I'm so useless and ungrateful. I would be better dead. Right. And the world would be better without me. Yeah. What do you think differentiates the people that aren't successful with suicide and those, I mean, I, I always go back to like the Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain week from hell that just happened uh, right. in t- like that, that like rattled me so bad because I, I was connected to both of those individuals via just my like pop culture. I love both of them. Mm-hmm. And so like that week was really hard for me because I thought, you know, I didn't succeed. I know many people who didn't succeed. I didn't necessarily want to succeed. I just wanted a different life. Like, what what is it why why did it happen well you know? i mean I just... again i think that you know i mean i i didn't know either of them personally i can't talk i mean i'd heard that you know she had had that she i think was either suffering depression or she was bipolar and her right. you know husband was leaving her and she was also had some alcohol problems and you know uh i'm not sure about the anthony bourdain thing you know People in the sober community are like, he was untreated, he was drinking, da da da, and it's like, you know, he had talked about it before, and then did it have nothing like the judgmental attitude. I know, right? Like you don't fucking know. <laughs> it's like, or like that it had something to do with the relationship right. with that girl. You know what I mean? And it's like, um, uh, but it's just like I we lose them, right? I think They're the gone. People that do it are usually the people that don't talk about it first. Yeah, they just do it. The people that keep talking about it aren't usually the ones that do it. Yeah. And that's why we keep talking about it. Yeah. The ones that I'm like, oh, I feel like I just want to do it. Like those people don't usually, they're just like, they, they're talking about it. The people that do it, you're like, they seem totally fine. And then all of a sudden, da, 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 you know what I mean? That seems to be the thing that I see. Um, so and- what's the answer like for our the, the kids that are coming up? I mean, you're hearing in the news – all the time now. Oh, high, so school, high school, high school, high oh, school. No, it's so mm-hmm. awful. I mean, even kids that are having, like, that survive, you know, you know, like these weird, like, like, like high school massacres, and then they have, like, residual, they have, like, survivor's guilt and kill themselves. And it's like, right. or that they're bullied and they kill themselves. And it's like, it's so sad to me because I didn't have those thoughts when I was young. And I was weird. I was a weird kid. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I was. I was a weirdo. But like I didn't I didn't never had suicidal thoughts until probably around nineteen. I like had my first nervous breakdown in college and I was like, Ugh. I was like well, I, I, I had a moment. I, I had to be sixteen or seventeen. I, I, this is the first time I ever mentioned this, but um I had a boyfriend. He was crazy. Um, my dad knew he was crazy. And so he was like, you can't go see him. And I was really mad because dad had said I couldn't go. <laughs> and so I ended up going in the bathroom and getting a bottle of Tylenol, you know, cause that's uh, going to kill you. Um, but my friend it'll was just there. Give you a, it'll just make you get a liver transplant. <laughs> I was going to say, it'll just eat your stomach. <laughs> um, but that was the first moment I was like, I'm going to take this whole bottle and I'll show him. And I didn't do it, obviously, but I mean, that's like a 16 year old thought Can't. and that was my first one. And I remember being, actually, it wasn't my first one because I remember being even smaller and having mm-hmm. thoughts of wanting to die. And I just think like, okay, had someone said something, cause at the time, no one talked about that stuff. We were in right. cult church and cult, you'd go to hell, if right. you, you know, and so no one talked about it. And so I just always think about what you're doing, talking about it, what I'm trying to do, talk about it. Like, is that going to bridge the gap with this generation coming up? Like, I hope so. I mean, I guess I heard that like a high school student is, was doing her APA language and composition research project on my book. I thought, Oh God, (laughs) God. (laughs) But good. But wow. I mean, I was shocked. (laughs) I was like, Oh and um, but I just I think, yeah, I think I think, again, always 
the destigmatization of all of this stuff is talking about it, whether it's sex addiction or drug addiction or s- mental illness or suicide, is knowing that you're not alone and being able to talk about it and not feeling shame about it and no- you know and getting help, not feeling like there's something wrong with you because this is going on. Right. And knowing, again, knowing you're not alone. I think that's so key. I mean, here's two crazy bitches right here. You're not alone. (laughs) Yeah, you're not alone. It's like, it's okay to have those thoughts, you know? And it's like, the the key is to not act on that shit. That's it. Yeah. You know, it's like, we all have those thoughts. I still have those thoughts. I have sponsees to have those thoughts. Some of them are connected to, we don't know where they're connected to. You know, mental illness, who knows? You know, I mean, according to Wetzman, you know, a lot of times when your dopamine is really like has plummeted, you know, your brain is like, I got to get the fuck out. And it's like, I got either dopamine or I got to get out, you know, because I was like, I had written a piece where I'd gotten ringworm. I mean, who gets ringworm, right? Like, I, I, and what am I in third grade? Like, I don't even know I got it. And, um, uh, I was treated like such a leper by the medical community and by my friends. They were just like, love you and your ringworm from over here. Like, bye. <laughs> like, no one would touch me or hug me. Like, I showed up at the free clinic. And, and it's like, you know, they've got like people, like homeless people camping outside. Okay. And they come in and use the showers. And as soon as I was like, hi, I have ringworm. They like <laughs> quarantined me in like a room for like four hours it was so awful and um I ended up starting to feel really gross about myself because no one would come near me or touch me and um um I had a thought about using and I wrote an article about it and um I guess when you feel ashamed or less than your dopamine drops and then of course you're gonna try and fix it because I was like you know I thought my first thought was like, where are the syringes in here? And I thought, you're six years sober, bitch. Like, what are you talking about? And I didn't understand why I was having those thoughts. But again, feeling less than or feeling ashamed makes your dopamine drop. You can make your own do- dopamine drop by talking shit to yourself. Wow. So, that is so, I, yes. yes. It's so important that we don't shame people who are using or on a relapse or each other. Because you can actually affect their fucking brain chemistry. So it's so important to be loving and understanding and not make people feel ashamed and not make people feel less than. Yes. You know, and, and, doc, so and this doctor finally like treated me like a human being and I start crying. <laughs> right. Like, thank you for loving me. And my yeah. Room. And I was like, thank you for like, you know, and, um, but that's, you know, that's a big thing is like all of us like having compassion for each other. Yes. That's so interesting about the dopamine dropping because I still struggle very much with binge eating. I mean, I will just eat so healthy and exercise and be wonderful for, you know, a period of time. And then I'll be in the freaking pantry with the box of Czech cereal, putting handfuls so big that I'm choking, you know? Right. But I think it's very much tied to what you just said. Something has happened to kind of trigger shame in me. My dopamine drops and and I can't drink. I can't smoke. Sugar and starch and all that shit will will totally up your dopamine. Like your brain doesn't care if it's heroin or an eclair or a dick. It does not care. (laughs) It does not care. It's just like, get this dopamine up. Yeah. Yeah. And usually that's it. And then, I try to yeah. explain that to people, like, because I have, a, you know, a fitness coach, and she's like, quit, Ben, stop. Oh, and yeah, see, that's helpful. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, and she she is trying to help, but I'm like, dude, I What's going understand. on in your head right before you do that? It's like, I got Are you gotta, talking I, shit about yourself to yourself? Yeah, I'm usually either talking there shit about go. myself, or I'm, like, bordering on the suicidal thing. Like, I there just can't go. deal with this life. I can't, I can't deal with this life. Check cereal. <laughs> I love you know the I mean? that should be that should be their advertising campaign. I know. <laughs> They're like, oh, well, the little They're like, yay, thanks for that. Right. You're welcome. Checks. Feeling Don't suicidal? Have some checks. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it's the law? check cereal. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, that's I mean, perfect. that's what's happening is mm-hmm. you're seeking your dopamine is fuck is low. I hate to be so geeky about it, but it's like, you know, and obviously I'm simplifying it, but. 
you know, I'm not a neuroscientist or whatever. And you can look at Dr. Howard Wetzman's stuff and it's so fascinating. And, um, he has a whole series on YouTube and I love him so much. And, um, he's become a really close friend of mine and I call him a lot with just like going like, what is happening? You know what I mean? Like, um, but, uh, yeah, that's, I think you need to, that's what's preceding it. Yeah. Is a, is, is, is a type of depression. Right. And, and then you're you just run to, as an addict, you run out of options. You're, you're like, man, well, I can't even Yeah, eat. when you're sober, yeah. What are your options? Like, yeah. Eat cardboard. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I've actually thought, like, can I just, like, create a new addiction? Like, I actually, this is how ridiculous addicts are. I, I, I am perfectly, I'm probably the healthiest I've ever been right now. And I actually thought a couple of months ago, oh, I could just start cutting. <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm like, oh, my God. And the second I lo- right? I, I love that- our brains. I love our brains. It's, well, I did that. I did that in my 40s. I started cutting in treatment. I'd never cut before. I'm like, am I a 13-year-old emo girl? Like, what Seriously? is happening here? I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I'm standing in my kitchen. I'm like, look, you just start cutting my Whoa. leg. Oh, like, my God. What the hell it's is not- wrong with me? You know? It's super, super... First of all, I have scars on my ankles and my wrists from that, from, from just doing that for a couple of months. And, um, I, it does give you a, an endorphin rush because your body's like pain and then you see the blood and blah, blah. And it's really, really addictive. And, um, I would say absolutely not. If you're embarrassed and you got a tattoo over your one, <laughs> like, like cutting is thing. not the way to go. That's the other thing. It's like, um, it's so but stupid. again, it's like. You know, again, you're seeking relief. You're in pain. You're seeking relief. So, okay, how can you have relief without hurting yourself? I mean, that's the thing that we have to shift as addicts because our natural thing for me still is self-destruction. Yes. Right. You know, I'm a piece of shit. I don't deserve, you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. You know, even with the book, even with all of that stuff, I still struggle with like, I don't get what the big deal is. Like, I'm a fraud, you know what I mean? And that book is the most honest thing I've ever written in my entire life. I mean, no, believe me, there are scenes in there, as you know, that I did not want to write. I was like, God, I do not want to write this book. And, you know, that scene specifically, some of the sex addiction stuff was mortifying to write about. And I just thought, I am writing this because someone has had an experience similar to this, where they have done something sexually with someone that they did not want to do, Because they felt the person was going to be angry or they didn't want to seem like a prude or they were loaded or whatever. And they went along with it and then hated themselves after and didn't understand what was going on. And I thought, that's what you're writing it for. You're not, if you're writing an addiction memoir and you're trying to look good, like you're not being honest enough. I'm sorry. It's like, yeah, I mean, people are like, you seem like a dick. I was like, I was mentally ill and on drugs. Like, yes, I was a dick. Like, I'm sorry that I threw over being likable for being honest. Right. Well, Amy, I just love you. I thought Augustine Burroughs topped it. And then I thought Sarah Heppola with Blackout was there but this book this is Aww. this is the addiction memoir you no one will feel alone reading this i, know, I could they're like god i thought i was bad <laughs> you're like the one we're like oh i feel like such a good addict compared to amy <laughs> but it's wonderful and thank you for for putting it out there it's i i think it's so important we all keep talking and i agree. um yeah, so the last question I have for you, this podcast is the same 24 hours, meaning we have the same 24 hours in our day, but it's what we do with those those hours, like not shooting up and not drinking that leads to our greatest health and success and happiness. But outside of staying clean, what is something that you do on a daily basis that really grounds you and sets your 24 hours up for success? Um, I think I stick, I, I stay connected to people. I have a sponsor, I have sponsees, you know, my mom has dementia now, so I'm, I, I, I'm dealing with that and really being of service. I call my father. Um, I respond to every single message I get, um, regarding the book. And, uh, I try and I try and stay in service, which sounds so corny because that's so not who I used to be. It was all about me. Being of service is like, to me, that makes me feel like I have a purpose in life, which is bigger than the way I look or how I feel or, you know what I mean? And so I try and serve that purpose, which is, you know, 
helping people. Well, I love it. This book is going to help. Yeah, help and it's like, and, and also bringing some humor. Like, don't take yourself so fucking seriously. Like, like <laughs> laughing about stuff. Like the fact that I laugh that I shot coke in a bike helmet. Like that shit's funny. <laughs> like it's horrifying. Yes, but like it made really good sense at the time. And it's like you know we have to. That's a for me. That's a huge way that I deal with my shame is owning it and making fun of it. Right. You know, let's laugh at ourselves. We're well, all I hope together. to God to get your TV going. I mean, because this book on uh, a screen, I mean, it would make the biggest impact. Yeah, it would be really exciting to have us brief. So I'm hoping. Yeah, it's well, we're moving forward. So we'll That's see. Awesome. Yeah. Well, good luck, Amy. And thank, thank you, you again so much for having so much. Me. Just a few words before I go, you guys. You are not alone. And the reason I have guests on the show, like Amy, like Sarah Heppler, like Annie Grace, is because we've all walked in these shoes. We've spent time at the bottom, and you're not alone. So if you have an alcohol problem, if you're an addict, and you would like a safe space on the internet to talk about it and to meet with other like-minded people, please check out my website, gratefulsobriety.com. It's a hundred percent free group, secret group on Facebook. Nothing is required of you except a desire to quit drinking, to quit using and to live your purpose and a better life. So just keep going. We're here for you. Reach out anytime.